Hello, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning to those who are still in morning time. Uh, welcome to this webinar event organized by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, thank you for joining promptly on the hour. Um, we're going to wait a couple of minutes uh, for other um, attendants to uh, to join. Um, so please uh, just just wait a couple of minutes and then we can start. Thanks. Okay. Well, again, good afternoon, good morning, um, welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining this webinar event uh, organized by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, GTOC. Um, very warm welcome to you. Um, it's really fantastic to see uh, lots of people attending this live event, uh, which covers a really important set of subjects that are really crucial to the lives and livelihoods of millions of people uh, in, in the North and West African region. Um, the presentations today uh, will also be exploring uh, questions around um, political economy, and will also raise important questions surrounding the, the role of external actors. Um, the title of this event is uh, Via Mali, Morocco and the Canaries, Shifts in Roots and Methods in Human Smuggling in West and Northwest Africa. Um, the event is uh, based on the recently published report series, Human Smuggling and Trafficking Ecosystems, North Africa and the Sahel. Um, this uh, covers the changing dynamics in, in Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, Niger, Chad, and Mali. Um, uh, yeah, the 2023 series um, considers smuggling from and through Libya Tunisia, Morocco, Niger, Chad, uh, and Mali, and the ways in which these dynamics play out differently in the individual countries in focus um, as the global economic picture kind of worsens, governance strains become more pronounced, and the peace and security challenges have certainly risen. Um, this event um, presents the, the main findings of the Mali and Morocco country-focused research reports, um, covering shifts in irregular mig migratory flows in West and Northwest Africa in 2022, um, including human smuggling dynamics in the Canary Islands. Um, we have three speakers today, um, all our staff working for the Global Initiative. Um, uh, I will just introduce them now uh, to save a bit of time uh, in the order in which they'll be speaking. Um, the first speaker is Floor Berger, She's a senior analyst um, within the North Africa and Sahel Observatory. Um, her research focuses on uh, conflict, migration, instability, and organized crime in the Sahel region. Floor will be presenting on Mali, uh, in particular, human smuggling trends in Northern Mali. The second speaker today is Tasnim Abderrahim. She is an analyst also within the North Africa and Sahel Observatory. Uh, her research focuses on human smuggling 
uh, and EU North Africa um, cooperation on migration. Um, Tasnim will be talking about migratory flows uh, from and through Morocco um, into Spain, the Spanish um, uh, enclaves and the Canaries. And then lastly, um, Lucia Bird uh, is our third speaker. She is the director of the West Africa Observatory. Um, her research focuses on human smuggling, human trafficking, drugs trafficking, uh, cybercrime, uh, and she has a, really ha had a focus on Africa as a whole. Um, Lucia is going to be talking briefly about some of the key trends in maritime irregular migration flows uh, to the Canaries and smuggling activities related to these trends. Um, I am your moderator today. Uh, my name is Harry Johnston. I'm a senior analyst within the North Africa and Sahel Observatory. Um, my research background um, with the Global Initiative has focused on conflict, uh, organized crime uh, and governance uh, with a particular focus on Libya. Uh, just briefly, I'll just run through um, how we're gonna do uh, this event. Uh, we'll start with a presentation by Floor. Um, that will be uh, about 10 minutes long. Um, then we'll have a, a presentation from Tasnim um, and then Lucia. So we're, to we're starting on, on Mali, we're moving on to Morocco, and then, yeah, and then a, a brief presentation on the Canaries by Lucia. Um, we'll then have about 20, 25 minutes uh, for uh, Q&A. Um, so for those of you who would like to ask uh, a question, um, please um, write it in the Q&A tab, uh, and um, we will try to answer that in the kind of second half of this one hour long session. Um, I think that's all. So um, without further ado, um, I can pass over to Floor, Floor Berger. The floor is yours. Thank you, Harry. Um, so if we can get the PowerPoint up, that would be great. So um, yeah, thank you everyone for um, joining today. And um, as Harry said, I'll be uh, focusing on Mali and especially um, Northern Mali. Um, I decided to focus on on this specific region because um, that's where the vast majority of the human smuggling flows take place, Mali being a departure and a transit country, but also because that's where most of the security and political changes um, have taken place in 2023. And so I want to explain how um, these changes have impacted human smuggling trend. Just want to um, say quickly that we do also monitor migration through southwest of uh, Mali, so that's through the Kai region. But I will not be mentioning uh, talking about it today, but obviously if um, anyone in the audience is interested to know more about that specific um, well region and, and migration trends in the south, we can um, talk about that in the Q&A. Um, so we can move to the next slide. Um, for the for Northern Mali, there are two main hubs, just uh, broadly speaking, Timbuktu and Gao. Um, and I'll focus mostly on, on um, Timbuktu and then briefly, briefly talk about Gao. So Timbuktu has been for the uh, past four or five years now the most important hub uh, for human smuggling activities in Mali, the most important in terms of flows, so number of migrants uh, transiting through that city. Um, and also the most stable. Um, why the most important? Basically, you know, the flow is linked to the stability. So um, Timbuktu itself as, as a city has been relatively stable, but the whole um, region as well, um, as well as the roads um, and along the roads and tracks leading from Timbuktu to the north towards the Algerian border, which is where uh, most migrants are heading. Um, relative stability because, you know, there are armed groups operating in that specific area, but they're not fighting each other or they were not fighting each other and they um, both ben were all benefited from um, human smuggling. So they were either directly involved as um, transporters or drivers, for example, or they benefited from it indirectly through um, taxation at informal checkpoints. But basically, um, everyone more or less got along and agreed that human smuggling was something they could benefit from, and that created a favorable environment for the people of movement, for the movement of people 
uh, many goods, of course, um, from Timbuktu to the north toward, towards Algeria. But that completely um, changed in 2023, as I'm sure most of you are aware. Um, the relative stability of Timbuktu and, and more largely of Mali's northern regions did not hold in 2023. I'll go very quickly on the political and security changes that I'm talking about, but I obviously want then to focus on the impact on human smuggling. So the three main events, basically, if we can um, resume it that, that way. The, the first one is the um, decision of the Malian authorities to um, end the UN peacekeeping mission called MINUSMA. Um, and so between June, June and December, uh, MINUSMA had to withdraw from its bases. Most of them um, are in the north. Um, and they actually completed this process now just um, two days ago or yesterday, actually. Um, and as they were withdrawing um, from their bases, basically that triggered um, the resumption of hostilities between the rebel coalition that is known under the the acronym C, uh, CSP, Cadre Stratégique Permanent, um, so between them and between the Malian Armed Forces and the uh, Russian partner Wagner. So this is the first clashes between these two conflict parties um, since the signing of the 2015 peace agreement. Um, I mean, tensions were mounting for a while, but the fact that MINUSMA was withdrawing from these bases and that they were handing them over to um, the government was really what triggered um, the actual fighting because some, a lot actually of these bases, uh, military bases are in territories that are controlled or used to be controlled by um, rebel groups. So that triggered the fighting. In addition to, um, to the renewed fighting between the CSP and the Malian Armed Forces, we've also seen higher pace of attacks by JNM, which is the Al-Qaeda um, coalition group operating in the Sahel. Um, obviously also fighting the fact that the government increased its presence in the north. Um, so stepping up attacks against the uh, Malian armed forces, the FAMA and Wagner, but also against civilians. Um, and here the most important thing to, to, well, to know or to um, highlight is the blockade on Timbuktu. Uh, which has been ongoing since early August, um, where they basically control the ins and outs of the city and uh, prohibit all movement of goods, um, including humanitarian aid, um, entering the town by road, either from the north, from uh, Algeria and Mauritania, where most of the supplies comes from, but also from southern Mali. So those are the three main um, changes. And we can go to the next slide. So now let's uh, let's see how that impacted human smuggling in Timbuktu. As I said, it it's 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 ma it's a major well event for a lot of reasons, but including for human smuggling because it used to be that once you know as a migrant once you've reached Timbuktu and you've gone through central Mali, which is you know a hotspot of violence, basically the rest of the journey is relatively safe at least from a security perspective. Um, but now. That that can uh, yeah completely completely changed, and um, I'll go through um, quite a few of these changes. So the first one um, is regard to the flows. So uh, first week or ten days of the blockade, so uh, beginning in the first two weeks of August, um, movement was completely put to a halt, and there were no no one going in and out. Migrants were stuck at different stages depending on you know where they were on the road uh, when the the blockade was announced, um, including some just 20 kilometers away from Timbuktu. Um, and then after this first, um, yeah, let's say 10 days of, of complete stop, movement eventually um, resumed. Because uh, it's important to note that the blockade does not prohibit the movement of people, only the movement of goods. Uh, but still, in the in the beginning, it was, it, it was extremely tense because in addition to the blockade, they were um, um, clashes um, um, as as the government was moving closer to Timbuktu, etc. So it was a very very um, high tension moment. Um, and then, as I said, it started e easing a bit, but 
JNM uh, obviously having imposed a blockade was extremely suspicious of anything moving uh, in and out, and so they were patrolling um, way well. Well, they were con completely controlling um, the the arrivals um, and the people leaving, and um, suspicious of maybe, for example, security forces hiding um, in cars or or people and migrants smuggling goods in. So, you know, like with big, big bags or big luggages, they, they wanted to check that no one was uh, was breaching the rules of the of the blockade. So very, you know, movement resumed, but high, high scrutiny. Um, and so what happened is that um, migrants and, and, yeah, migrants started using pinas, which basically using the river instead of the roads. Not that JNM does not control the river, but they control them a little less. So we see much, much uh, harder to, to patrol. Um, and also migrants um, were told by Passer to um, travel without bags or with just a small bag with their personal effect, but definitely not bigger luggages as they um, sometimes, you know, can have a pretty large bag. Um, and then the, so, you know, movement resumed, they're now arriving in Timbuktu again, um, actually able to reach Timbuktu, but the, now there were also changes in, in the stay in Timbuktu itself. So um, obviously in the very beginning uh, of the blockade, no one was going out, so some migrants got stuck in Timbuktu. But then there was also another issue is that um, as the, um, as the hostilities started between the government and the CSP and also the blockade, um, for Timbuktu region, for example, 30,000 30, people left, um, fled to their villages or to nearby countries, um, mostly by fear of ethnic reprisals by, by the authorities and by Wagner, who uh, target Arabs and Tuaregs. Um, and many of them, many of these people who fled, um, or some of them anyway, were drivers and traders and just people involved in like those um, flows between Timbuktu and Algeria, uh, or Timbuktu and Mauritania as well. And so at some point there, there were not many people able to drive migrants towards the border. But that didn't last very long because um, um, eventually, you know, people came back, but also everyone who was there uh, could only move people and not goods so and that was not an issue but still at some point migrants you know initially they would stay for 24 or 48 hours in Timbuktu and now they were staying for much longer up to two weeks um and then obviously the the last point is the, is the you know Timbuktu Algeria part of the journey so um, this used to be extremely safe, barely any clashes between armed groups, just checkpoints um, where Passer have good relationship with both JNM and the CSP. So um, typically it was it was pretty rare that um, we reported um, you know migrants get, getting caught in in armed um, clashes or even uh, in the, indirectly. But now um, the level of violence was much higher. And so um, there were risk of uh, drones um, and drone strikes, which the, the government was using a bit, but also uh, direct clashes between the CSP and um, the authorities. And also, as I said, JNIM really likes step, step him up, stepping up uh, their attacks um, all in that in, all in that area. So um definitely the road was less safe. It doesn't mean people didn't take it. Um, drivers are accepted to drive because it's the only business remaining um, at the moment and, and to this day. And migrants um, want to, you know, want to continue their, their journey um, towards Algeria. The, the last point is the, is the price. Um, as you can imagine, because of the blockade, um, uh, fuel price, well, Fuel is pretty rare, um, and the price more than doubled since the um, start of the blockade. Um, and also, obviously, that has a direct impact on the price of, of the journey. But the second thing is that um, drivers who typically take migrants to the Algerian border, they come back with a car full of goods from the Algerian border, and this is not allowed any, anymore because of the blockade. So it's basically a huge loss of income for drivers. 
Um, and so they make up for that loss of income by increasing the price of the of the journey for migrants. So um, in 2022, we reported that on average, um, the, the journey from Timbuktu to Algeria, Algeria was um, about 110 euros. And now we are getting um, information that it costs more than 200 euros for that same um, journey. Um, so those are some of the main changes um, that we've seen. Um, just maybe one point before I turn to Gao is that we um, we have looked into that situation pretty well in detail, and I think it's quite interesting to look at um, yeah at the changes that that blockade has brought. But if we have a bit of a bigger um, picture. Um, to to con to conclude Timbuktu um, analysis basically is that flows have resumed now. For example, uh, in October it was even higher than earlier in the year. Um, so yeah, flows have resumed. Migrants are going through Paso are are getting their migrants to Timbuktu and to Algeria. Um, there are drivers that despite the 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 you know higher insecurity and and despite the risk continue to do it. So um, we see a lot of small, maybe short term, short to midterm changes, but in the in the grand scheme of things, you know, Timbuktu is is and remains the biggest, by far the biggest um nod for Mali in terms of human smuggling. And this despite this complete shift in um in the security landscape in the north. So very quickly uh, on Gao, if we can move to the next slide. So yeah, Gao, I'll be quick because um, basically everything I've said about the, um, the security situation with the resumption of the hostilities, et cetera, et cetera, also impacted Gao, the, like Gao and the route towards Kidal. Um, but I, um, yeah, I thought, I thought I'd put this map, um, which I, I hope you can all see nicely because um, this is a map we done, we've done in the beginning of the year. So this is the actually the first quarter of 2023. And in the first quarter, I was saying that, you know, as this map shows, um, those are all the security incidents, all the armed clashes. And you can see that um, Niamey Gao Road, so Niamey is south um, of Gao along that, along that La Bezonga Road. Um, but basically, Gao and Menaka, I mean, you can see the amount of armed clashes. But basically, once you've reached Gao, and it was the same for Timbuktu, once you reach that and you go further north, then you can see there literally, think, well, there's one armed clash. Um, but it's that was the stability that um, we I talked about in the beginning. But, you know, if we would do the same map now, obviously, that road that goes from Gao, Bohem, Anifis, Kidal, and even see then though it's Tessalit in the north and the Algerian border, then the, now we would see lots of um of arm clashes as well uh, in the second part of 2023 because of the resumption of hostilities. But um I think the main point for Gao is that it, it is a much smaller hub. It has been impacted by instability for a long time, much more than Timbuktu because of the number of armed groups. Um, because the armed groups fight each other, because the government has a bigger presence there as well, it's that Mali-Niger border, um, and even the Liptako Burma with Burkina that is extremely volatile. So um, in the monitoring that we've done in the past couple of years, there, there's always been so much fluctuation because of, um, of, of, of the security situation. So it, it wasn't such a big change like in Timbuktu where it went from like relatively stable to um, you know, to a full-on blockade. Um, so I think that um, that was it for for Gao. Um, yeah, and then uh, just the next slide to conclude. So I, I mean, I already did a bit the conclusion for Timbuktu, but I think my main takeaway um, monitoring human smuggling um, in, in 2022, well, the past two years, basically, is that uh, human smuggling networks are resilient. Um, I focused a lot on this presentation, of course, about the, the changes, because it's, as I said, it's interesting to see how migrants and passers and drivers react to these big changes, um, how it impacts their realities and how they conduct their business. 
but at the end of the day, the changes I've highlighted are relatively small. Um, and despite those major political and security turbulences in the past two years, it's not just 2023. I mean, 2022, we had like ECOWAS sanctions um, with the closure of borders, etc. So, you know, major um, events, um, human smuggling networks find ways to make it work. Uh, it might be short-term impact or medium-term impact, but they quickly adapt with the methods of transportation, the security around uh, how they keep migrants. The, the prices go up and down, but doesn't impact the amount of people that want to leave uh, or want to use that road. And um, yeah, migrants make their journey through Northern Mali. Um, I think that's it for me. I'm happy to um, answer any questions in the Q&A and uh, for now, let my colleagues um, continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flor. Um, I will pass it over now to Tasnim uh, to, to speak about um, the Moroccan context. Thanks. Um, thanks, Harry. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as uh, Harry said, I'll focus on uh, on Morocco. Um, so let me first uh, maybe start by saying that Morocco represents a key hub for uh, mixed migratory flows towards uh, Europe. It's a key country of origin, but at the same time plays a key role as a transit uh, point for foreign migrants and asylum seekers aiming to arrive in Europe. Now, most migrants and asylum seekers passing through the country uh, come from sub-Saharan countries, but there are um, varied other nationalities, including um, Syrians and uh, Algerians. Now, um, there are different factors that shape migration um, from Morocco. Uh, for Moroccan migrants, there is a complex combination of socioeconomic factors, including uh, unemployment, deteriorating public services, regional disparities that usually propel people to leave uh, the country in search of better opportunities. These socioeconomic conditions also affect uh, foreign uh, migrants, um, and actually foreign migrants in Morocco were heavily impacted by uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which led to uh, substantial job losses in the informal sector where the majority of undocumented migrants are employed. And the situation of foreign migrants is also affected by uh, counter-migration uh, measures implemented by the uh, Moroccan authorities. Um, these include, uh, for instance, the forced relocations of uh, migrants from coastal areas to interior parts of the country. So the authorities basically do this uh, as an attempt to uh, reduce pressure on these embarkation hubs and to prevent migrants from uh, from undertaking the sea crossings. Um, usually people impacted uh, by these measures are, are vulnerable individuals who, who live in uh, in the street or in, in, in forests in the north or in makeshift camps. Um, what happens usually is, is that these, um, these forced relocations sort of disrupt um, and delay migrants' uh, journeys, but migrants often try to regain coastal areas and, and resume their uh, their journey. So the, the impact of these forced relocations remains temporary. Um, in the Moroccan context, it's also important to flag the role of uh, the geographical proximity, which further facilitates mobility uh, between Morocco and, uh, and Europe. So essentially, there are three key migratory pathways from Morocco to Spain. Uh, the first one is from northern Morocco, uh, from the beaches along northern Morocco towards mainland Spain. Um, second is the land routes uh, towards the Spanish enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla in the north. And finally, uh, the route from southern Morocco and western Sahara towards the Canary Islands. Um, another final factor that's important to take into consideration when looking at the dynamics in Morocco is geopolitics. Um, Geopolitics actually plays a key role in determining the level of collaboration on migration between Morocco and, and Spain. Um, 
when we say collaboration, that includes uh, border management and uh, and, my, and controls on 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 uh, con um, counter smuggling activities, in addition to uh, readmission of third of uh, of uh, my Moroccans who are in an irregular situation in um, in Spain. Um, now, during uh, 2022, uh, which is the year that uh, the reports we are discussing today focus uh, on, uh, there was a decrease in arrivals to Spain from Morocco overall. However, the situation was not even across the different uh, routes I mentioned. Um, basically, last year, and probably the most remarkable uh, thing in terms of migratory dynamics from Morocco is that there was an increase in land arrivals to the Spanish enclaves of, uh, of Ceuta and Melilla. Uh, now, these uh, two Spanish cities are usually highly guarded um, and fortified to, uh, to prevent uh, migrants from, regular migrants from access accessing uh, the cities. Uh, last year, uh, there was a proliferation of mass entry attempts, uh, which have which had which which led to an increase in the number of people entering uh, the city by fifty three percent. Numbers overall remain modest. I mean, last year there was uh, less than one thousand nine hundred uh, migrants arriving uh, in uh, in the country, uh, but still that constituted an important increase in comparison to the previous year. Um, the increase in arrivals in the Spanish uh, enclaves was caused uh, basically by a proliferation of mass entry uh, attempts. There were uh, three or four entry attempts that happened between um, January and, uh, and March. The most significant uh, mass entry attempt happened on 24 June when around 2,000 people tried to enter Milia. Eventually, only 140 people uh, managed to enter, uh, but the majority were uh, forced back um, as the Moroccan authorities, as there was heavy deployment of Moroccan uh, forces and the Spanish authorities also uh, pushed back uh, migrants. Uh, this event was very tragic because it has led to the death of 23 people who lost their lives in uh, in a stampede. That is 23 people according to the to official uh, figures, but some CSOs actually estimate that the number uh, can be higher. Now, usually um, the migrants who are involved or who participate in these mass entry attempts are usually the most vulnerable. They are usually the migrants who cannot afford to pay uh, for sea crossings from Morocco, which are very uh, costly. And what we have seen uh, in the first half of last year in Morocco is that there was an increasing uh, concentration of uh, migrants living in vulnerable conditions in the north of the country, basically living in the forests that are um, close to the, uh, to the enclaves. Um, that's usually where migrants uh, gather for several months uh, before attempting uh, such entry uh, attempts. Uh, this year, uh, in 2023, there was a decrease um, in, uh, in arrivals in the enclaves. Uh, so far this year, uh, around uh, 450 people uh, arrived, which is a substantial increase of 75% in comparison uh, to last year. Uh, this change was in part driven by uh, by increased um, security controls uh, around the enclaves by both the Spanish and the Moroccan uh, authorities. So that was the situation uh, for the uh, Spanish enclaves. Another important change that happened uh, last year in terms of uh, changes across migratory routes was the decline uh, in departures towards the Canary Islands uh, route. Um, so basically, uh, for during twenty uh, last year during twenty twenty two, uh, more than fifteen thousand people arrived in in the Canary, which was a decrease of thirty two percent in comparison to twenty twenty one. But I should say that uh, arrivals in the Canaries uh, involve people uh, leaving from uh, Morocco, Mauritania, Senegal, and Gambia. However, last year, the decline in arrivals in the Canaries was likely attributable to uh, changing dynamics in Morocco uh, itself. 
um, migrant departures from uh, from Morocco towards the Canary Islands had actually um, fluctuated last year. Uh, in the early months between January and March, there was substantial smuggling uh, activities, uh, which was in continuation uh, of dynamics observed in the last quarter of 2021. However, um, since March uh, last year, there was a decrease uh, in such smuggling uh, activities, which led to uh, d decreasing uh, arrivals in, um, in Spain. Uh, the final uh, route I want to touch on is the uh, northern uh, is the route from northern Morocco to uh, the Spanish uh, mainland. Um, also last year, departures uh, along this route remained uh, slow, uh, moderate throughout the year. Um, there was a total of 14,000, uh, 14,213 sea arrivals in mainland Spain. These are people who left from Morocco and, uh, from, uh, Algeria, but this was a decrease in comparison to 2021. Uh, um, it, Basically, the limited use of this route is due to the uh, heavy uh, security enforcement implemented by the Moroccan uh, authorities in the north of the country. Um, this was not a new development in 2022. Um, basically, this enforcement goes back to the, uh, to the early stages of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, um, and uh, which disrupted movement uh, along this route, in addition to uh, to enhance the EU uh, Morocco collaboration on migrant on border enforcement uh, in uh, this area. Now, the interesting thing is that the uh, the strict controls uh, that are enforced uh, in the north part, in the northern part of um, of the country, has also shaped the uh, nationalities which embark from northern uh, Morocco. So basically, Moroccans are more likely to use this route because they have easier access, obviously, um, there. However, Sub-Saharans are uh, less likely to depart from the north of the country um, because uh, of the measures implemented by the government, as I mentioned, uh, the government, the authorities uh, deport, routinely deport migrants who gather in the north of the country to interior uh, towns. Also, sometimes there are um, unofficial restrictions that are um, in, that are uh, applied to uh, to prevent uh, migrants from reaching the north uh, of uh, of the country. These restrictions are not uh, systematically enforced, but they do happen and they disrupt uh, migrant uh, movement towards the north uh, of, um, of the country. Um, uh, this year, we have seen uh, some change in movement uh, along uh, this route. Basically, arrivals in mainland Spain have uh, increased by 15% uh, this year. Um, and as I said, it's it's quite difficult to to say where whether the people who are arriving in mainland Spain are uh, are departing from Morocco and and Algeria. We do not have um, uh, accurate data for um, for that. Uh, but it seems this year that there was an increasing tempo of departures from from both from uh, from Morocco and uh, and Algeria. But there has been particularly an increase in Moroccan nationals. Uh, arriving uh, via mainland, uh, arriving in mainland um, Spain, which um, can suggest that that that, that departures uh, have have increased from uh, from uh, from Morocco. Um, so uh, maybe just one uh, final thing um, to say is that uh, the the enforcement measures that are implemented. Uh, by the authorities impact migratory flows from uh, from Morocco, uh, but smuggling networks in Morocco are basically very uh, resilient. They they develop quickly uh, methods and and measures to uh, to adapt to strict controls and to shift to shift their uh, their working methods or their departure uh, locations. Um, and in part, they are uh, driven by sustained uh, demand for uh, for their um, services. Uh, what's clear is that uh, 
interest in migration in Morocco remains high, be it among uh, Moroccan nationals or among uh, foreign nationals, foreign migrants living uh, in the country for the reasons outlined, I outlined at, uh, um, at the beginning. And uh, this is actually likely to continue to, uh, to, to encourage or to, uh, to lead to more adaptation uh, from smuggling uh, groups to diversify their offer and, uh, and methods as they seek to respond to this demand and to adapt to, uh, to the increased um, surveillance. So I'll, I'll stop here and happy to answer any questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tasnim. That was great, very comprehensive um, overview. Um, now I will pass over to Lucia, um, who can share some insights on um, the Canaries. Thanks, Lucia. Thank you very much, Harry, and thank you to all our previous speakers. We conducted particularly in-depth research on this route in 2021, 2022, and then have been doing ongoing monitoring, and I'll be drawing on this and engaging with some more recent trends. As many of you will know, we've seen a sharp increase on this route towards the Canaries from Morocco, um, Senegal and Mauritania primarily since 2020 in particular. This is the second material reopening of this route with the first climaxing in 2006. We believe that the surge in this route was driven by a number of factors, including COVID and related border closures and heightened economic stresses. Um, as well as the growing securitization on a number of other routes. We see predominantly Moroccan and Senegalese nationals moving on these routes, as well as a wider range of other West African nationals, most prominently in 2023, Ivorians, um, as well as Malians and a number of others. I'd like to highlight three key trends regarding movement on this route. Firstly, this route is not going away. Secondly, already among the most dangerous routes in the world, it's getting more dangerous. And thirdly, that a significant proportion of those moving are women and unaccompanied minors. To take each of these in turn. F firstly, the resilience of this route. As noted from the second quarter of 2022, we had seen a sustained decrease on this route, leading a number of analysts to predict that we would then see a tailing off. However, from Q the second quarter of this year, we've seen a reversal of this trend. And in the third quarter, an unprecedented surge, particularly in October, where we saw an enormous spike. Over 15,700 individuals arrived in the Canary Islands on these irregular maritime routes in October, which was more than the entirety of arrivals last year. By early November, we had seen over 32,000 arrivals in 2023, exceeding the peak in 2006. Now, the timing of these spikes is to some extent in parallel to growth across a number of other irregular migration routes to Europe and is part of a broad trend. And Senegal is playing a growing role on this route. And the surge in movement seems partly linked to a growing practice of using larger boats from the summer of this year, but also really packing the number of individuals on these boats. We have seen single boats have 320 individuals on them, uh, compared to more averages around the low hundreds, um, which presents, as I'll come to in my second point, a significant danger. And, and I'll come back to this at the end, the resilience of this route really speaks to the limitations of responses that are based on blocking flows. Secondly, around the dangers of this route, as I noted, we're seeing increasing proportions departing from Senegal. This means longer journeys, five to 11 days compared to around 48 hours. And data sets on mortalities on this route, on this route vary significantly. The NGO Caminando Sin Fronteras suggests that almost 800 individuals lost their lives in the first six months of 2023. However, as Tasnim noted previously, statistics, official or otherwise, are likely a significant undercount. Mortal mortalities anecdotally reported in Senegal are extremely high. We see numerous boats overturning not far from the coast, many of which will not be picked up in official figures. And we have reports that it's very unclear how many of these uh, fatalities close to the um, coast of Senegal um, will actually be investigated and recorded. To the third key point, that a significant proportion of those moving are women and un unaccompanied minors. 
Back in 2021, over a third of arrivals were women, and we have no indication that this has decreased. Instead, we're seeing reports of more and more unaccompanied minors and women traveling separately. To touch quickly on the smuggling infrastructure, which is underpinning these flows, the vast majority of movement on this route is smuggler facilitated, but we're really talking a very different smuggling markets across the three key departure points of Senegal, Morocco, and Mauritania. Mauritania is a distinct and important ecosystem, which has been in a period of flux, responding to heightened government and Spanish enforcement action last year. And we've seen a dispersion of departure points with some emerging further south, for example, in the village of Ndiago, which is 15 kilometers north of the border um, with Senegal. Um, but I'll focus on the two largest departure points and the ones which demonstrate the most contrasting uh, smuggling networks. So in Morocco, as Tasnim mentioned, um, the, the networks are, can be quite well structured and highly criminalized, um, with a number of these being very hierarchical, um, many migrants that have undertaken the journey speaking repeatedly of, of the chief, the kingpin, the hajj. And one statement by um, one migrant who had reached the Canary Islands really stayed with me when I asked him to describe this hajj figure. He said, have you heard of the joker? He's like the Joker. You know he's there, but you never see him. And that really speaks to a significant level of organization with lit limited visibility to the top of that hierarchy. And we see local Sahara Sahrawi um, being central players in smuggling from Dakhla in the Western Sahara and its environ, um, as well as organized crime groups that have long been operating on Morocco's northern coast, facilitating boat departures. Um, and we see recruitment of prospective migrants uh, across villages in Morocco. Another sign of the professional element um, is that we typically see captains uh, from departure points in Morocco returning back to Morocco after having made the route. And we know that they can earn up to 6,000 euros per trip. So as I'll come to in contrast to, to the structures in Senegal, this is quite a professionalized smuggling environment. And law enforcement investigations in the Canary Islands have confirmed that a number of smuggling networks, predominantly Moroccan, have elements based in the archipelago, including for facilitating onwards movement towards mainland Europe, again, underscoring the transnational elements um, of, of these networks. Touching briefly on Senegal before wrapping up, we do see a lower level of organization than Morocco. At the time of the deep dives in 2021, the picture was really a very low level of organization. Uh, some kind of collaborative organization um, of, of uh, individuals clubbing together to fund the journey, as well as some networks, but not extensive hierarchies and large groups. Now, since then, anecdotal evidence suggests that we are seeing an increase in the professionalization of the smuggling industry from some departure points in Senegal. And this is exactly what we would expect following a period of sustained high demand and what we have tracked across a number of different smuggling markets. For example, in 2021, we had relatively few reports of complicity with security defense um, forces in Senegal. Again, anecdotal reports have suggested that this may be increasing. If this is the case, this is again, a significant indicator of professionalization. So to draw these points together, what does this spike in 2023 tell us? Despite ever greater investment in surveillance, in monitoring, in law enforcement on this route, on the West African shores, around the Canary Islands, and in the seas in between, it really underscores the limitations of the responses that are premised on blocking flows and securing borders, and a reflection of ongoing extremely high economic stresses across countries in West and North Africa, coupled with significant instability in some areas. And it really highlights the fact that a sustainable response must be independent, underpinned by the expansion of available legal pathways for migration. And if not, particularly on maritime smuggling routes, which are always the most dangerous, we will continue to be seeing extremely high numbers of fatalities. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lucia, um, for such a comprehensive presentation. That was great. So um, we've covered a lot uh, in a very short space of time. Um, and I imagine uh, there will be some questions coming in. Um, I 
I'm aware we only have about 10 minutes uh, before we reach the the hour. So um, I will jump straight into uh, some of the questions that have been put in the Q&A. Um, there are a couple here for, for Tasnim um, on Morocco. Um, yeah, the, could the increased departures from Senegal, the Gambia, Guinea, explain the lower number of departures from Morocco? And another one on uh, information related to the Sudanese arriving in Morocco. Uh, what route are they taking? Uh, are they coming from Darfur or elsewhere? Would you be able to um, to speak to those questions, Tasnim? Thanks. Um, yes, thanks, Harry. Um, so on the first um, question, could we uh, could the increased departures from Senegal that can be explained the low numbers of departures from Morocco? Um, we cannot say that yet. Um, I don't think we have uh, the data so far to say uh, that there is rerouting that's um, that's happening. Um, that remains one uh, uh, one possibility um, because apparently the uh, the prices of departures um, from Senegal um, are much lower than uh, the prices of departures uh, from uh, Morocco to the to the Canaries. Um, and there are speculations that that could be uh, leading some um, some migrants to uh, to leave um, from from Senegal instead of and Mauritania instead of uh, instead of Morocco. Um, but I, I cannot I cannot confirm that because I just do 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 not have uh, the data to to uh, to support that. Um, the uh, the other question on uh, the uh, the Sudanese, um, there has been actually some increase uh, last year in the arrivals of Sudanese nationals uh, to Morocco that became evident actually after the, uh, the the event I mentioned, the mass entry attempt that happened uh, at Milia uh, in uh, in June twenty twenty two. Uh, during uh, that event, actually, a lot of uh, the migrants uh, that were eventually, um, some of the migrants that were detained by the Moroccan um, authorities and and some of the migrants that died in, in, in the incident uh, were Sudanese. Um, also, uh, last year, Sudanese were uh, the first nationality of arrivals in, uh, in the enclaves. Uh, which was actually uh, a, a major change from the trends that were observed in 2021. 20, um, 20, uh, for this year, we cannot, uh, or I can, I don't know if there has been an increase in um, in Sudanese arrivals after the start of um, of uh, of the conflict, uh, but it doesn't seem uh, to be uh, to be uh, the case. Uh, but in generally speaking, for uh, for the routes that are followed by Sudanese nationals to arrive in Morocco, so they basically leave from Sudan, go to Chad, Niger. Uh, Algeria and then enter uh, Morocco um, from there. Um, however, uh, this this year actually there has been an, um, some important uh, increase in Sudanese arrivals in in North Africa, um, including Egypt, uh, Libya, and Tunisia. A substantial change was uh, observed in in Tunisia specifically, where, which has become uh, the first point of embarkation towards Europe for um, Sudanese uh, nationals. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Tasnim. Um, yeah, so uh, in terms of the questions, I, I'll, I'll try to group them uh, according to the, the, the region or the country in particular. Um, yeah, I do, there is one question that's just come in around, um, uh, yeah, for, for, for Lucia um, around departure points uh in in uh, in Senegal I'm not sure Lucia if you could speak to this question around which departure points are becoming hubs for irregular migration in Senegal sure um so the hubs the main hubs have really been Umbur in in the south of Senegal and St. Louis in the north of Senegal. And those were already hubs back in the 2006 crisis, um, and they have remained the central departure points since the re-emergence of this route in 2020. The balance about which is the most important varies over time. Certainly um, in early 2021, Umbur seemed to be the most prevalent departure point. Now it seems that St. Louis has gained prominence, but we've also um, seen over the last year, 18 months, 
growing diversification of departure points. So we, while those remain the two central axes in terms of volumes of departures, we do see a number of other departure points all across the coast of Senegal, including much, much closer to Dakar, with a couple even seen within the city itself. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got we've got a question for Floor um, related to, to Mali. Um, with the recent and increasing tensions in northern Mali, uh, how are Algerian security forces reacting? Uh, did they reinforce controls? Uh, do you think it could upset human smuggling dynamics in northern Mali? Um, is that one that you would be able to speak to a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Harry. Um... So, well, I think there are two things. There's like Algerians' reaction to basically um, the peace agreement, which they are sponsoring. It's called the Algerians um, Peace Agreement. So there's like Algerians' reaction to the political and security situation in the north, um, which, by the way, they have said very little about. They've been extremely uh, silent. Um, but uh, in terms of human smuggling, so for migration, we have not heard um, for example, that you know migrants were stuck um, at the border because there were more controls and they like returned to Timbuktu or um, like to the you know northern Mali. Um, so we haven't seen an increase. Um, what is you know the Algerian security forces changing their behaviors um, towards that? And I doubt that it would you know upset human smuggling dynamics in northern Mali. Um, However, they have been uh, more Algerians, uh, Algerian authorities have been a bit more concerned with obviously the, the massive flow of like like just IDPs, internally displaced people, because as I said, from Timbuktu, there are 30,000 people who fled. Um, Kidal, it's the same number. So we're talking a lot of, about a lot of people who are moving either to their villages, which is considered, which was considered safer than the actual towns. Uh, towards either Mauritania, Niger, or Algeria. Um, so the Algerian authorities were, were concerned about, you know, seeing um, thousands and thousands of people going towards their border. Um, but but I, I I think for human smuggling dynamics, we, we will not see a strong reaction from Algeria, who would, which would, you know, upset the, the current trends we, we're seeing. And as I said, through Timbuktu flows are um, more important than ever before. Um, so migrants are heading towards Algeria and then obviously um, further towards Europe. Thanks, Flo. Um, yeah, we have a, a, a lengthy uh, question from Christoph from uh, ar around um, smuggling rates of uh, migrants from, from West Africa. Um, yeah, um, I won't read it out because it is quite a, a long one, but it, it touches on a number of different um, factors uh, related to um, sort of cultural and also environmental um, elements uh, that are relevant to um, uh, to, to smuggling. Um, and Lucia, would you like to to, to speak to this briefly? Um, we've just got a couple more minutes. Sure, I'll keep it brief. I think. Um... It's important to look at this dynamic of instability and in smuggling from two perspectives. Mm. Firstly, I think a general point is that where we see licit formal livelihoods damaged by instability in a number of regions, we do see growing reliance on informal or illicit um, economies and livelihoods, which, which can include some of those that are listed. The other point which I think intersects with this is that Often we we hear um, of, of of many people talking about the instability driving um, emigration. Now this is definitely true. However, it is important on the Canaries route in particular to remember some of the key nationalities that are arriving in the Canaries and that have been prominent in the Canaries for, for a little while, which is Senegalese, Moroccan and Cote d'Ivoire. Now, these are not the countries in the Sahel that are being currently affected by um, large scale armed group operations. Um, and the vast majority of those that are arriving in the Canaries um, focus on economic stresses as as the really the key drivers for the movement. So I think important to 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 look at this instability and and, and smuggling dynamic both in terms of those that are operating as smugglers and and yes, you know, smuggling and engagement in formal illicit economies 
can become a more important livelihood when others become even more scarce due to instability, but also for the demand for these services. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lucia. Um, sadly, I think we are going to have to wrap up uh, now. There are a couple of questions that we haven't been able to address, but um, uh, really we see this as a continuing uh, exchange and dialogue. It's been really, really gratifying to see uh, lots of uh, attendees, lots of people participating, lots of questions. Um, obviously, do go online um, and uh, you can uh, potentially find uh, answers to some of these questions in the reports um, that we've published. Um, and we will be continuing to uh, organize these kinds of webinar uh, series and events. So do uh, keep your eyes open for um, the next one. Um, we'll be um, promoting it on all the usual social media. Um, thank you so much uh, to the speakers. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Floor. Thank you, Tasnim. Thank you, Lucia. And thank you again to all those who attended today. Um, we hope it was informative uh, and um, it, it was useful for you. Thanks so much. Um, take care and uh, have a lovely day. Bye bye.